everybody, the American Space Museum. I'm Mark Marquette. We're so glad you're with us to stay curious today as we celebrate LM number 10, Grumman tail numbers there. Sitting a little cockeyed on the moon 51 years ago. Today it launched off the moon at 1.11 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time on August 2nd, 1971. Our fourth and uh, third from last landing on the moon as 15 and, uh, 16 and 17 would follow this mission. And we're going to celebrate that today on Stay Curious uh, with Marty Winkle, my co-producer, who worked on this lunar module, walked all around it. Marty, there it is on the surface. You ever think about that descent stage being on the moon? And, and you uh, walked all around that thing. And then he was inside of the little, all the ascent stages, looking through those triangular windows as the lead electrical engineer, doing his thing like testing out the uh, the antennas and the switches and, and all, everything working. And there were 400 electrical switches in there, right, Marty? He said something well, like between, that. Between the switches and knobs and controllers and instrumentation, 400. Yep. And all, all the instrumentation, and that was part of his job was to make sure all those worked right. And we're very proud of him being a natural treasure. Marty, of course, also worked on the launch processing system on the shuttle engines. But today it's all about 51 years ago, two men camping out for three days in this lunar module they called Falcon. And uh, we wanted to celebrate that today. They landed in a region called the Hadley Region, at 6 p.m. July 30th, 1971, Eastern Daylight Time. Apollo 15 was a spectacular mission with the first ever human-driven vehicle on an alien world and the only stand-up spacewalk outside the docking hatch. We're going to particularly show you pictures of when David Scott stood up and took pictures from the very top of that lunar module, some 23 feet above the surface of the moon. Um, it also had the first trans-Earth deep spacewalk, and not to mention the moonwalkers finding an important moonwalk. Uh, uh, and uh, we're checking our settings there. We may have a little reverb going on. Okay, let me set that up there. The gain is fine. So, the gain was too high last time. Okay. Game There we go. Now we're back with the audio. And uh, all right, we are live, and that's why we have these problems here. Sorry for the reverb. Anybody hearing that? Uh, but I uh, accidentally flipped it off there. As I was getting wound up talking about Apollo 15, I was just a teenager back in 1971. Uh, and uh, it was an amazing time to be alive and watch what was going on in the moon in our moon race that we'd already won. Apollo 15 was the first of what we call the J missions, all right, that were true lunar exploration. And because they canceled 18, 19, and 20, this one wasn't intended to carry a lunar rover vehicle, LRV, but it did. And we're going to show you in a minute the original uh, LEM that was intended to be for Apollo 15. Uh, sadly, you know, we had an important Genesis rock, and then they left behind a fallen astronaut memorial, a little mini sculpture, and yawn. Does anybody care a half a century plus one year later? Well, sadly, not many. You'd probably be hard-pressed to find any news celebrating this. Uh, yet, Apollo 15 was one of the most ambitious NASA crewed missions ever. And uh, it necessitated the lunar module named Falcon popping over a three-mile-high Mount Hadley to land within a football field distance from a meandering lava tube that looks like a riverbed. A spectacular place, and I've called some of the rare photos, I think, that aren't normally seen of Apollo 15 from Flickr, the Apollo site archive of Flickr. is quite outstanding. If you've not been there, please check it out. You can see... Like looking at the film strips, there, Tom Usiak, our good friend, this photographer, and Mark, back in the old days, you'd see the frames and everything. They even show the sprocket holes 
as they transferred these uh, valuable film to high resolution digital image and on Flickr. There for you to see and do anything you want with. And you're going to see me uh, caress a couple images or two to get the most out of them here. Just a minute. Hail to Commander David Scott, now age 90. He is deceased crewmate for our fellow moonwalker Jim Irwin, who died about a dozen years ago, maybe 20 years ago, of heart problems. And Command Module Pilot Al Warden, those of us that have met him love him as Uncle Al. He passed away a year ago, March, and uh, sorely missed in the space community. Uh, there are many visuals to see. Color television recorded hours of the moonwalks that weren't broadcast live on television since 1971. They, were gonna, they didn't have advertisers to show much except on the uh, evening and morning news. Uh, but imagine today, it would be constant. You'd see them on the moon. Uh, how about the confirmation of Galileo's theory in 1600s that a hammer and a feather would fall at the same time if there was no atmosphere? And Scott demonstrated that quite dramatically when he took a falcon feather these are all Air Force guys, so the Falcon from the Air Force Academy, they think is where the Falcon came from, and a hammer, and he dropped them, and boom, they landed on the surface of the moon at the same time. A very cool science experiment uh, done in front of live TV. And then how about the lunar rover parked far enough away to show the live liftoff from the moon at 1.11 Eastern Daylight Time today, August 2nd, 1971, 51 years ago. And did you know that when Dave Scott walked away from that lunar rover for the last time, he put on the control panel a copy of the Bible and is sitting there right now. In fact, Marty, it's pretty much, uh, if the electronics would have survived and you're an electrical engineer, all you have to do is put new batteries in there and probably drive the rovers away. Do you think that, that solar radiation would have uh, fried some of the electronics needed to drive it? So. Marty says he wouldn't think so. It had to be, uh, it had to be insulated anyway to protect it. So, uh, uh, so that will happen, not in my lifetime or Marty's, but maybe in my granddaughter, who's seven months old, maybe her lifetime. She'll hear about someone driving away the first lunar rover, LRVs, what they call them, uh, that uh, Irwin and Scott drove on the moon. But the all Air Force crews successfully performed their duties on a complex mission that set the standard for scientific investigation on the moon, followed by 16 and 17. This was so ambitious, they didn't know if they could get it all done. And they, they did everything they wanted to. There was one little crater that they didn't stop at because they got behind in their timeline, but it wasn't that important. So uh, let's go through some of the pretty pictures here. Before I do that, we do want to uh, promote uh, our, our T-shirts are now being uh, printed. Uh, I'll be wearing one hopefully by the end of the week. Uh, these are to, uh, the Chris Callie and his father, Paul renowned space artists. There's their work. Chris is the Blue Earth Gemini 4 EVA. And his dad, Paul, did the Armstrong sketch in the White Room on Apollo 11's launch day. And then Power to Go, the mighty Saturn V taken off on that black tee. This is to help supplement our loss of income while we're closed and merchandising and admissions, as well as just promote the Cali artwork as we partnered with Chris and his famous father uh, to uh, bring you uh, maybe uh, th uh, nine different t-shirt designs a year. Three times a year, we'll do three of them. So pick these up and we'll be announcing when we're gonna ship these out pretty soon. Uh, now let's look at what else we got going today. Oh, let's look at the boys there with the lunar rover. And uh, that uh, left to right would be Jim Irwin, and then the center is Al Warden, and then David Scott. And they had, of course, uh, matching Corvettes with the racing stripe. And I just saw a post on Collect Space where the grandson of Al Warden is restoring his grandpa's Corvette uh, to bring it back to fine shape. But there's a, there's the Lunar Rover. Uh, Kind of a, looks like something like a soapbox derby, Marty, <laughs> you'd kind of build uh, with lawn chairs and, 
and uh, uh, expose the surfaces on it and so forth. But important were those fenders because the fine dust of the moon's regolith, the soil of the moon's called regolith, would churn up our big rooster tail. And uh, we had uh, this one in Apollo 16, the uh, fenders came off and they had to, to do a fix there on space. We've had lots of cool swag over the years, uh, but uh, the po uh, I love the uh, bumper sticker, okay, uh, the first man looter roving vehicle there, team member. Uh, behind me is a postcard uh, that's got a lunar coin on it. I'm not going to move around too much. Workers like Marty were given a facsimile of the American flag in one of the photos. Uh, of course, one of the most famous ones, David Scott saluting the flag. You can always tell the commander now after Apollo 14 on any EVA uh, spacewalk is they're wearing the red stripe, okay, on their arms, on their helmet, and around the thighs of their legs. So that's how you distinguish Jim Irwin from uh, David Scott on the moon. Well, here's where they landed. You can see this very easily in a telescope, all right? Uh, the Apennine Mountains, these were named after features on the Earth. And then an enlargement there shows you how they're, they're, they're going over this mountain and landing at a strategic area on what is called a rill. This is actually a collapsed lava tube, all right? There it is from the astronauts looking out their window uh, this is what they saw on one of the revolutions before they they uh, undocked and then landed, okay? So about right where my shoulder is, right here, is about where the landing site was. They went, and this is a mix mash of lunar mountains, which are caused not like earth mountains and tectonics. These mountains were caused by the impact of a giant small asteroid. I guess there's a giant small, right? A, 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 a medium-sized asteroid, maybe two miles, three miles in diameter, hit and created these these big areas that got filled with lava and it pushed the lunar debris up. So these mountains are actually the interiors of, of the moon brought up. And they wanted to sample some of that. Then they wanted to get next to that rill and look inside what was excavated three and a half billion years ago in the four and a half billion year history of the moon. Beautiful site there. Well, this is a replica of the lunar site with Bob Pearson. Uh, rest in soul, uh, his soul in peace. Bob, we lost him a couple years ago. Sure wish he was around because he taught all the astronauts how to land on the moon in the simulator out the flight crew training building uh, at Kennedy Space Center. And he's told many wonderful tales. And we reprise those once in a while when we get it. But we, we never got him on Stay Curious before he passed away. But this is a, a, a plastic kind of relief map that Bob owned. And he's got all the other landing sites worth a fortune. Uh, uh, and uh, hopefully his family's taking good care of those. But here is from Lunar Orbit, the landing sites, proof that we were there. Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter still orbiting the moon has photographed up close all the lunar sites. There's a descent stage. You see the LRV is a lunar roving vehicle. That's where it was parked to get the lift off. We're going to see here in a minute. And then the ALSEP, Apollo Lunar Science Experiment Pro Project. The uh, and you can see where these are actually, some of them are lunar rover tracks, but then some of them are also human tracks kicking up the lunar dirt that's darker underneath and lighter on top. Much like a talcum powder, very fine. The lunar uh, experiments included a, uh, uh, a, earth, a moon quake detector, seismic uh, uh, machine. There was a core samples that were drilled into the moon and plugs put in there to gauge the, the heat and noises inside of the moon, uh, quite sophisticated for 51 years ago. And looking out the triangular windows is David Scott and Jim Irwin are coming in for the landing, and then they land. And what was planned but argued about was they were going to land and open up the docking hatch, not the hatch they were going to walk out on the moon where the porch and the ladder is, but the docking hatch they were going to open up waste that oxygen so that David Scott could look up and do his looking around 
the high point of any place is the best place to see your geology. And a geologist named Silvers was very key to the astronauts, trained all of them, along with Gene Shoemaker, and uh, a famous astronomer, Gene Shoemaker. And uh, he wanted them to look out the top of the lunar module, which is about 23 feet above the surface. And here they are looking over the... Uh, uh, which, which radar antenna is that, Marty? Uh, the S-band antenna. That would be communications with the Earth there. Uh, and then you got the mountains in the background. Then in the three days they camped out, they would see that mountain revealed as the Terminator moved across them. Then Scott moved a little bit more to his right, and there is the S-band antenna. Uh, no, that's the, uh, the, the, the rendezvous radar antenna is so important. All right. Okay, so now he's going to his left. He's going to his right, to his left. Marty's correcting me as he's looking out. I want to know how much of him was sticking out. And Marty, what was he standing on? Was he standing on the ascent cover of the engine? Okay. See, I, uh, but that's at one six gravity. You sat on it, uh, waiting for your work to be che uh, checked and stuff like that. So imagine that you sat there where he had his feet looking out the window. Now, do you think half of his torso or just his head was looking out? No, he's at least waist high. Okay, he's at least waist high looking out. So what a spectacular view. And the only astronaut to do that, because they didn't do it on 16 and 17, they didn't want to waste the precious uh, oxygen that was in a, a tank about the size of a basketball. I've seen that pointed out to me in photographs. Of course, that oxygen is condensed down, but it kept him alive for three days. And here he goes further to his left, looking at the Hadley Mountain there, and that's another radar antenna. No, VHS antenna. VHS antenna for the uh, television and other communications. And then they're showing the RCS, the, the thrusters there, uh, over a crater. How cool would that be to see that, Marty? And uh, But the original lunar module for 15 did not have a bay open, which would be right above my head, bay uh, uh, quad four is what they call it, as you go clockwise around the four quads of the lunar module, left of the, the uh, ladder there is, is quad one. Now that ladder, you couldn't walk up and down it because it would crush it. It was made for this one sixth gravity. But this is hanging at the, I think it's on the ground now, isn't it? At the Apollo uh, Saturn V Center, Kennedy Space Center. They took it off the, from hanging up there and put it down on the ground. But this is a real McCoy, as we used to say. Uh, was going to be LM9, was going to be Apollo 15s, and they, they decided not to use it. And it wasn't going to be used again because all of them were going to have a, a lunar rover in them. And LM10 become the lunar module for 15 called Falcon, the command module with Al Warden circling the the uh, the moon some 30 times was uh, called Endeavor. So here is the Boeing cor uh, people working, uh, showing a demonstration of how this was going to fold up like a, kind of like origami, all right, the legs would fold over and it would tuck into the quad like a Murphy bed, which is a bed that's in the wall that you pull out. And then uh, there it is. So, and I think one of them people is David Scott. I think with the the white, uh, the far white uh, cap on there is David Scott. Checking this out for himself. How are we gonna do this? Well, there is the lunar module. All right. There's um, uh, on the moon. The tilt was of some concern. There's about a maximum 15 degree tilt uh, that uh, is is the safe level. Of course, they're going to launch off the moon if it's tilted almost sideways, Marty, because it's uh, the only way to get off the moon. But uh, probably pose a little bit of different uh, dynamic vector of the, the first few instances of launching off the moon, but then everything was perfect. And uh, so we wanted to show the uh, this is kind of a standard picture, but showing you some of the debris around uh, Falcon as they got ready. And here's a, a different picture showing you, boy, a lot of debris around there. And in the distance is one of the astronauts at the lunar rover. So, uh, and I think that this is Scott that's hanging around here. And, uh, but uh, wherever we go, Americans make a mess. I wonder what this thing is, Marty. 
there that that uh, with the, the the round thing on the end of it there. But it was obviously something they didn't need. Okay, so they just left it on the moon there. A picture that I have not seen very often. And once again, these are on uh, uh, check out Flickr. And here's another thing to check out is Google Moon. All right. Google Moon, and I checked it the other day, and, and it didn't work like it used to, so maybe it was just a bad day, but you can go to where this is, the camera is where a photograph was taken at this lunar uh, spot on uh, Google's moon. There's the landing site above me, different traverses are shown there, in different spots where they took a photo, at elbow, they call that the elbow of the lunar rill. And there's the photo that was taken, all right? One of the astronauts, it looks like Irwin, taken right there. And Google Earth shows you the photo of where it was taken on there. A very cool app to check out of our uh, Apollo landing sites uh, on Google Earth. Then uh, we've got this spectacular image, I think, showing you footprints, lunar rover tracks. It looks like a, a race has been going on there. That's a solar wind experiment. Uh, there, the triangular thing, just a sheet of aluminum foil, basically. But I enhanced this photo from this original. Look, I went backwards. From this photo, there's what it looks like on Flickr, okay? So I downloaded, put it in a Photoshop, increased the contrast and the blacks, and got rid of the highlights, and bingo. That's really what that picture looks like. So many of the images on the moon are what a photographer would call overexposed. And when you see this flicker and, and every image is, is exactly like they took it, you're going to see so many bad images. There are more actually bad images on the film roll than there are good ones. Uh, the astronauts, they weren't trained much in photography. And this Hasselblad camera is bulky and it's, it's attached to their chest. So they're limited in the creativity of it all. Uh, but uh, uh, still, a lot of the pictures are overexposed, and you can fix them up to look like this. And we're going to see another one dramatically here in just a minute. Yeah, this one I fixed up. I love the look of the, the rover tracks in the foreground, the footprints, and Hadley Mountain in the background. It's just a spectacular image. It's like a landscape. Uh, un, uh, you can't see anywhere else, of course, because it's the moon. And here is another spectacular image, Marty. Get out your arrow and find Falcon for me. I know you know where it's at. There it is right there. There's Falcon. They're over, I think they're over two miles away from it, taken with a telephoto lens. Right, keep that, that there, Marty. Here is the next image I'm showing you. The not enhanced image that's on Flickr, and then the one that I enhanced. All right, look at that beautiful contrast there, and the grays and the whites. It really gives you a sense that the moon has has a lot of different textures, and the astronauts even talk about more colors there than they could see in in the camera. But there you are, three miles away. Boy, that's a long walk if that lunar rover comes out on you. But that, to me, is a gorgeous photograph. And there again is the original. And we're going to go from there to uh, just a photo for all you home, uh, to remind all of you home repair people and woodworkers and hobbyists out there that love working with tools. I'll bet you don't have any tools that have any cords on them unless you bought them 10 years ago because most of the tools I see at your box stores have what? Batteries on them. Light batteries, okay? Like NICAD batteries, or lithium batteries. Who pioneered that? Yeah, the Apollo 15 was one of the missions where they had battery-powered drills to drill four to eight feet into the hard surface of the moon. All right, like drilling into rock is exactly what they're doing. And they had trouble with them getting stuck. In fact, uh, they left. They had three EVAs, extravehicular activities, three times they went out on the moon and they got back in. Each time they got back, back in, the first time was for 14 hours and the second time was for 16 hours between EVAs. So they spent a lot of time resting and looking out those windows. And it was hard work. The gloves were hard to work because the gloves have a natural tendency to stay open. 
put under the pressure. So to grab something like my coffee cup takes a lot of energy to grab it and tools and pounding it. So that's right, their fingertips become uh, worn and bleeding almost uh, 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 with, uh, with, uh, and painful to some extent. But that is uh, no stripes on him there, so that's Jim Irwin. Uh, that's uh, drilling in there. But Marty, look at the headgear he's got there. They learned that being on the moon two hours that Apollo 11 did, and then two two-hour EVAs for Apollo 12, and then Apollo 14 was out there for like two four-hour EVAs, and that sun is so bright that they put shielding all over the helmet there. And you can see the little bit of shielding and, and levers that they could lift up and down to uh, all that Irwin's got there is just sort of like little peepholes outside of his faceplate there. One time his legs and the regular on it. Yes, Marty said, note all the dirt, the regolith on his legs from being, it clings to everything. And this is going to be a big problem going back with the Artemis astronauts is how to clean them up when they get back into habitats because we suspect that this fine, fine, fine powder of lunar regolith could could be cause problems with the respiratory tract of humans like asbestos and so forth. So we're already looking out for that. But yes, they got quite dirty, three EVAs, but they did take off their spacesuits when they got back in. After all, they were going to be in there for over 12 hours, so why not get comfortable? So they were the, the Apollo 15 was the first moon crew to take off their, their moon suits and hang out in their skivvy, so to speak. Uh, in the, the lunar module. Apollo 14 kept theirs on all the time. They didn't take it off. Uh, they didn't really uh, have enough time to put them back on. So, uh, But that was something that got perfected, better spacesuits on 15 uh, due to advances that were suggested on 14, 11, and 12. By the way, that triangular thing that you see with the colors on it there, there's another one, is a color palette to judge colors on the moon. And I love our silhouettes of our astronauts on the moon. They look like they got a butterfly net there uh, catching butterflies on the moon. But there we have both astronauts in silhouette. Don't know which one's which, but uh, I find that to be a picture that you rarely see if you've ever seen it. So that's why we want you to stay curious. This is that important Genesis rock, a very white anthroscop. I can't say it right. It's it's a, a, a rock from the very beginning of the moon, over 4 billion years old, though Apollo 17 brought back some older rocks. This is one of the largest rocks, and it's white, and they call it the Genesis rock because it dates back to the beginning of the moon. Very important. And above my head, they've got a name for that, Marty. Marty, I should have looked it up but it is a color palette to judge colors in the photographs. Very important for the scientists. Something that was important for the scientists, Marty, was when they were looking at the, uh, uh, the color photos coming back from the lunar rover had its own camera on it, all right, remote controlled by the uh, Johnson Space Center scientists. So they could actually look and zoom in on rocks and do their own scientific analysis, all right, with, uh, uh, from 240,000 miles away without the astronauts taking part. Yes, Marty? Okay. That's my... I, I didn't turn the gain down at all. Okay. I, I got a tape, so I can't get in it. I have a tape. Okay. I'll turn the gain down, we're saying, and I got everything plugged in, and the gain... That might be turning my gain down. One, two, three. How's that sound? Any? I got, I, I got the gain off there, and uh, so sorry if we got a little audio problem as usual here. Now I'm moving the gain, and does it change anything? Let us know. So that's better. Okay, that must be better there. Okay, thank you all for chiming in there. Marty's going to give me a list of who's watching today. But this is that famous Genesis rock. And those of you that know that we can bounce a laser off the moon in, in, uh, in uh, half a second and one second have it come back to hit us, this is what is striking, is this three-foot square of uh, uh, prism uh, 
uh, glass basically embedded in there to bounce it back on there. So let's say we got James Sigler watching. And uh, Christopher Mick says he's coming to Florida for the SLS launch. The hotels are virtually sold out. All right. Uh, Keith Sewell, thank you for watching. Robert Law is on us today. Thank you. Space Resources is watching. William Whiting. Uh, hey, Mikey Haddad. Glad that you're watching today. Uh, Mikey uh, got us uh, astronaut uh, uh, John David Bartow last Wednesday. You watch that on YouTube. Uh, with uh, uh, Lou Delgado, uh, another payload specialist with Mikey. And uh, we're looking forward to having him on every month uh, uh, doing uh, payloads with us there. Uh, Adrian Patrick, thank you. Uh, Patrick, thank you for watching. And Ben Hurset, he is a faithful watcher. Stay curious. And, of course, we got uh, uh, Mark Usiak, Dave Stangy out there. And, uh, and Tom Usiak. Thank you guys for watching today. So we got a question. Yeah, from Mark Usiak. Um, Apollo 13 was supposed to land at the Apollo 14 landing spot for our war. war. Uh, where was the original Apollo 15 spot? Or was it always Hadley Road? Well, it wasn't. Actually, they were talking about the Morris Hills was a region. Hadley Rill was chosen for this for 15. It was 14 that got jumbled up. 14 was supposed to go to a place called Mars Hills, uh, and they decided to send it back to where uh, uh, the Fra Mauro area, where Apollo 13 was intended to go to. Why did they want to go there? Because they thought there was evidence of volcanic activity there. And then Al Warden orbiting the moon thought he saw evidence of volcanic activity at the Descartes region, D-E-S-C-A-R-T-E-S, -E a, a Greek philosopher. And uh, though what he saw uh, was indications of volcanic activity, when the Apollo 16, uh, um, um, Charlie Duke and Commander John Young got there, they found that it was sort of a false positive. Uh, yet they did find volcanic orange soil that was caused by glass crystals on there. So, good question. There were several other areas like the Aristarchus region, the brightest region on the moon that you see right before full moon uh, on the western limb, has a bright rill that is called the Cobra Head. That would have been interesting to go to. They were also thinking of landing inside the crater Copernicus or the crater Tycho, which Copernicus is more likely because it's closer to the equator. Tycho's near the South Pole, and we took more fuel to get there. So the idea was each mission added to the science of the next mission. And they would not have been able to do all the science on Apollo 15, say on Apollo 12, 13, or 14, if they landed on the moon, because they didn't have the rover. And this allowed them to go to three or four very different spots. The mountains, which are dug up, by the impacts of asteroids, not like the plate tectonics here on Earth where, where the Earth's molten lava is moving our continents around. They slam into each other and create mountains. No, these mountains are, and some astronomers question the word mountains because they're not traditional mountains. They are eroded mountains created by the debris thrown up by an impact. So. Uh, that's a good history lesson. Maybe we'll do it on one of the Apollo landings or some of the, the places that we could have gone that maybe Artemis will go back to. But let's lift them off the moon there. I didn't, uh, we don't have the power in our computer to show you the actual lift off, but I'm going to post it on Facebook so you can watch it. Quite dramatic. I remember watching this live on television. Uh, of course, they're going to broadcast this live. You see the the, the lunar, you don't see the lunar rover, but you see this view and the astronauts talking in there, and then all of a sudden they just start doing a 10, 9, 8, 7, and 3, 2, 1 liftoff. And when it lifts off, Marty, a lot of things have to go right on your lunar module there, correct? Yeah. There are po points around that have to have pyrotechnics to disengage the bolts that connect it to the descent stage. Then the communication. Uh, cables and there's some piping involved have to be severed by a guillotine. And I go like this because it's truly a guillotine that Marty says he he worked with many times. And the pyrotechnics 
arm it, and it, in an instant. All this has to go, not within one second, all this has to go within probably a third of a second. And if any of it lags behind, it would maybe drag the, the, uh, uh, the, the set stage back down to the moon. But it happens six times perfectly, just like it should, just like the lunar module always performs right. You got a question there, Marty? No, just more people watching. Oh, more people watching? That's good. So let's look at some of this. As the lunar module came back up, and by the way, the you Grummies, I say Marty, you Grummies, the Grum and Lunar Module guys, and we're going to have one here Thursday. Bill Waldron said he'll come Thursday, and he was the lead engineer over uh, LM5, Eagle, on the moon, Apollo 11. But you guys didn't celebrate until that lunar module docked with the command module for the last time, and the rocks, the film, and the astronauts were all safe and sound in the mothership there that Al Warden was taken good care of uh, while they were orbiting. And you, uh, right, Marty? You didn't right. celebrate until, until everything was done there. And uh, so I asked this question to Marty and his friends there. Uh, Donna Rosendorf and Tom Celentano, thank you for watching. I asked him this question. Knowing that Apollo 13 was the perfect lifeboat, uh, the lunar module saved the Apollo 13 astronauts as the perfect lifeboat, why did they get rid of it in lunar orbit? Why wouldn't they keep it with them on the trans-Earth journey back in case something happened and they could get in there? Well, Marty, you know I asked that question to Bill Waldron, the, the Grumman engineer that we had on here before, and Bill's answer was, it was spent. There was nothing left of it. Uh, it wouldn't, it would not, uh, they would have had to pipe oxygen into the lunar module from the command module because it was designed to keep two guys alive for, you know, three days on the lunar surface and with a little bit of margin there, as we know, uh, with the uh, Apollo 13 situation. So I never thought that it would be completely spent, that it would be like towing uh, a dead weight back to, to Earth with you. So it had been more of a hindrance than a help. So they undocked it, fired its, uh, did they fire the ascent engine again? Or the, th or the, ra ra the thrusters to make it crash into the moon? It would have been the, uh, the thrusters. It would have been the RCS thrusters with no resistance, of course. A little bit of shove would put them in there. And then when it impacted the moon, it would rig the bells on all the instruments left on the moon on the previous missions and gave the moon a hollow bell ringing sound. It would reverberate after these impacts of the ascent stage, as well as the S-4B, the, the last stage of the Saturn V, they would aim it to the moon and crash it in there so it wouldn't be in the way of future uh, moon missions in there. So, But Al Warden did the first, this was his SIM bay, scientific instrument uh, bay there that you see with a wealth of science on there. And he did a lot of science, lunar science, Solar science and interplanetary science, gauging radiation levels. Import, I hope they're looking at that data now for Artemis. But here's one of the few pictures taken of Uncle Al on when he uh, did a, a EVA. Uh, they had to open, uh, depressurize the command module, and then uh, open up the hatch, uh, and then uh, which was amazing. And then he walked out. Now on the the first test of the lunar module, Apollo 9, Scott, uh, David Scott actually did a stand-up EVA in the command module. And then he did one on the lunar module on the surface of the moon. But uh, when you see the lunar Apollo 9 pictures, uh, Scott has a red helmet. Rusty Schweiker had a red helmet, too. And he was standing up in the lunar module. And they were taking pictures of each other. But I've heard Al Warden talk about his spacewalk. And he said... They took two crummy pictures of me on my spacewalk. They took hun hundreds of them on the surface of the moon. He said, come on, guys. You know, you should have took more pictures of me. Uh, but they took a movie of him also. And he made three trips to retrieve the film, folks. Why do you have to do that? Because the cameras on the side of this command module. And there's Al Warden right there. Uh, talking of, uh, that was uh, uh, three years ago, one of his last personal appearances. Uh, but there's cameras on the, uh, looking out there, and the cameras have film. 
So he had to get up uh, the cone here and walk down the, the side where there were handrails and pull out canisters of 70 millimeter film, I presume, and then go back and retrieve another one. And then he went back a third time to, to uh, uh, get did something. And then they ejected a lunar satellite uh, uh, in orbit around the moon. But there is Al Warden, rest in peace. Like I said, if you ever met him, uh, he'll be one of your favorite astronauts in, in your memories because he was a he he spoke uh, said he didn't mince words. Uh, uh, he liked the cuss some, and uh, he certainly didn't pull any punches about today's space program being being too much risk uh, 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 risk um, assured or. Well, uh, risk aversion uh, than uh, too much risk analysis and not enough going and doing it is what Al would say. All right. So uh, a great man, a great ambassador for NASA, sorely missed to this day. And of course, I got a picture with him. I paid 10 bucks for this picture at the last Astronaut Scholarship Foundation over six, about six years ago and had astronauts doing autographs. And he didn't care who I am. He didn't care less who I am. Now. Just he's smiling, and I got my picture made with him. But he was a nice guy to talk to back then. And then I met him at this event that was the Florida Institute of Technology 50th anniversary celebration of Apollo uh, in December uh, of uh, 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 um, 2019. And a famous stamp was made by the famous artist Robert McCall, and uh, a double stamp uh, talking about, you know, beautiful stamp, the conquest of a man on the moon on the left, and then the, the first interplanetary manned or crewed roving vehicle. Eight cents for a stamp. Marty, what did they just up it to? 52 cents now? 52. It's 52 cents now, 51 years later. For a U.S. postage stamp, and this eight cents eight cents stamp uh, certainly was a lot more important in in the world back then uh, than it was today. So, uh, uh, forever stamp is fifty two cents now. And I'll end our Stay Curious program here with two outstanding photographs. This we can call the uh, other visor shot. All right, uh, we of course call the visor shot of. Buzz Aldrin on the moon, the most iconic image ever made, I believe, uh, in the history of film. Uh, and, and Neil Armstrong is in the visor with the lunar module. Well, here you've got astronaut David Scott. I know it's him because of the red stripe on his helmet. And Jim Irwin sitting in a lunar rover there and, uh, in a, with a Mount Hadley in the background in a cool Apollo 15 visor shot. And one of my very favorite moon shots of all time Look at this lunar regolith with car tracks and human footprints there. It's almost like the astronauts hitchhiking. And I believe that's Irwin because I don't see the red stripe on his legs there. But this was probably the second EVA. Look at how dirty it is. But he might as well have his thumb out saying, Hey, buddy, I need a ride on the lunar highway there. How cool is that? I think it's pretty cool. But you know what's cool? is looking back at the Earth on any Apollo mission because they're the only ones that humans have looked back on in 50 years. 51 years this December is the last time that a human's eyeball saw the Earth like this, all right? And that's why we end our program with Stay Curious with the blue marble, the, the precious oasis for life where we're always reminded by astronaut Nicole Stott to act like a crewmate on Earth, not like a passenger, because we need to help protect this planet. Marty, what else you got there? That's it. All right. Well, everybody, thank you for staying with us on Stay Curious on this Apollo 15 show. Tell your friends to like us on YouTube and Facebook. We're also on Twitch and Spotify. Thank you, Marty, for a great Streamlabs production here. Sorry for little audio snafus, but... We're always working those out, it seems. And I thank everybody for supporting the American Space Museum. And until tomorrow, when we're going to talk about, tomorrow we're going to talk about shows of the month of August. And then Thursday, we're going to have Bill Waldron, Grumman engineer, on hand to talk more about this fabulous machine 
that he was in charge of uh, for a spell. And uh, can't wait to talk to Bill. He's always exciting. That'll be Thursday. So don't miss that. Until then, I'm Mark Marquette reminding you that we will be open next Monday, August 8th. So book your tour here at the American Space Museum to bridge the space between us.